Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and my name is Chris Angle, your host. The nature of The Philosophical Angle is to take concepts in current media and look into them and see how they're used in current media and compare them with what we know about its essence. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. Another one is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These are free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. So let's get right to it today. Uh, the concept of this week is from an article on the Wall Street Journal dated April 23rd of this year by Peter Diamond and Emmanuel Saez. The title is High Tax Rates Won't Slow Growth. I'm going to read uh, most of the articles for you and then we will go uh, uh, to comment and clarification and see if what they say in this article can possibly be true. And I'll proceed with uh, opening by reading uh, most of the uh, uh, article. And I'll start here with paragraph one. The share of pre-tax income accruing to the top 1% of earners in the US has more than doubled to about 20% in 2010 from less than 10% in the 1970s. At the same time, the average federal income tax rate on top earners has declined significantly. Given the large current and projected deficits, should the top 1% be taxed more? Because US income concentration is now so high the potential tax revenue at stake is large. They further state in the article, but will taxable incomes at the top 1% respond to a tax increase by declining so much that revenue rises very little or even drops? In other words, are we already near or beyond the peak of the famous Laffer curve, the revenue maximizing tax rate. The Laffer curve is used to illustrate the concept of taxable income elasticity. According to the author's analysis of current tax rates and their elasticity, the revenue maximizing top federal marginal income tax rate would be in or near the range of 50% to 70%, taking into account that individuals face additional taxes from Medicare and state and local taxes. Thus, we, the authors, conclude that raising the tax rate is l very likely to result in revenue increases, at least until we reach the 50% rate that held during the first Reagan administration, and possibly until the 70% rate of the 1970s. To reduce tax avoidance opportunities, tax rates on capital gains and dividends should increase along with the basic rate. Closing loopholes and stepping up enforcement would further limit tax avoidance, avoidance and evasion. But will raising top tax rates significantly lower economic growth? The authors pose. In the post-war US, higher tax rates tend to go with higher economic growth, not lower. Indeed, according to the US Department of Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis, GDP, annual growth per capita to adjust for population growth, 
averaged 1.68% between 1980 and 2010 when tax rates were relatively low, while growth averaged 2.23% between 1950 and 1980 when top tax rates were at or above 70%. <clears throat> the authors now list a couple of examples. So they say, for example, from 1970 to, 19, to 2010, real GDP annual growth per capita averaged 1.8% and 2.03% in the US and the UK, both of which dramatically lowered their top tax rates during that period while it averaged 1.72% and 1.89% in France and Germany, which kept high top tax rates during the period. While in no way does this prove that higher tax, top tax rates actually encourage growth, there is not good evidence from the aggregate data supporting the view that higher rates slow growth. Later on in the article, they state if some of the additional revenue is used for public investments with a high return, such as education, infrastructure, and research, it raises growth further. The neglect of public investment over the last few decades suggests that returns could be quite high. Lastly, the authors state, large losses in efficiency come when people are limited in their ability to finance good investment opportunities. Surveys showed difficulty of borrowing as an issue for startups. And higher education is influenced by the finances of parents and the earnings premium for higher education is very high. Access to investment financing is a much bigger issue for lower earners than for higher earners. By the time Bill Gates got rich, Microsoft was not likely to have trouble financing investments. Hence, increasing tax rates on the already rich might not hurt growth as much as increasing tax rates on the soon to be rich. Finally, they state, by itself, a suitable increase in the taxation of top earners will not solve our unsustainable long-term fiscal trajectory. But that is no reason not to use this tool to contribute to addressing this problem. Uh, for your note, uh, Mr. Diamond is Professor Emeritus at MIT and a Nobel Laureate in Economics. Mr. Saez is a professor of economics at UC Berkeley. So let's now just go to, uh, <clears throat> to some notes we've made and, uh, and just recap the article. Firstly, high tax rates won't slow growth. Pre-tax income of the top 1% doubled to approximately 20% since 1970, average tax rate declined. Conclusion, if the tax rate increases, the question, will this income decline? OK, that is the question. Between 1950 and 1980, top tax rates were, were at or equal or greater than 70%. Growth averaged 2.23%. Between 1980 and 2010, tax rates were low. Growth averaged 1.68%. Their conclusions, raising tax rates to 50% likely will result in revenue increases. And they equate government growth and government collection of revenue with economic growth. As you see here, They've noted that the, uh, the government growth or the, uh, the, the uh, economic growth in the 1950s through to the 1980s was higher on average than it has been since 1980. So how do we understand 
this conclusion because I'm sure many of you out there do not equate government revenue with economic growth. Since 1980, let's take a look at some facts that might help clarify this situation. In 1986, the tax rate was reduced during the Ronald Reagan presidency to 28%. Also in 1986, 50% of, business, of businesses were C-Corps. Now, a C-Corp is your normal form of corporation with stockholders and, and at that same time, we only had 5.6% were S-Corps. Now, an S-Corp is one that you can put on your income tax as income flowing to you personally. In other words, the corporation makes it, it actually comes to you, and you put it on your federal income, personal tax income, directly. It doesn't go into a corporate tax return. And then the corporate tax return would pay to individuals through uh, dividends or salary, incomes of personal income. Other forms of S-corps, uh, besides S-corps of, of pass-through uh, types of corporations are LLCs. These are partnerships, sole proprietors. So in, uh, by 2007, this 5.6% as subchapter uh, sub S-corps jumped to 21%. And so in total, 75 so by 2007, 79% of, pa uh, of pass-throughs, such as S-Corps, uh, came from the 1% filers of the rich. So you can see, also uh, one more fact, 2003 tax on dividends came down to 15%. This produced uh, a taxable income revenue from the 1% on personal income by growing it 178%. So, how does this happen? How does this, wh what happened here? What's happened is that the tax code changed, allowing individuals, high income or high uh, n uh, net worth individuals, to declare their personal income and not have it inside C corporations. So they went from C corporation growth of wealth and production to uh, smaller type pass through corporations directly coming to the income onto their personal income tax statement. So that helps explain some of the, uh, of the, uh, <coughs> of what happened here, but the, ver the, the essence, the correlation, again, with high taxation and high economic growth has still has yet to be totally explained. So let us get rid of this, and let's go to answer that question. As I erase this, let me explain that production, when we have production, any kind of economic production, there are four factors that are involved. One is risk, another is time, another is effort, and another is information and knowledge. Okay. 
So we'll write that down. We'll abbreviate it by saying that everything you do in life, and specifically economic life, is a sacrifice. And you do it for a reward. And your sacrifice is made up of your risk in doing the sacrifice, your time, your information and knowledge, and your effort. You sacrifice and employ these, these tools in order to make a reward. So what happened, possibly? Risk. Between the 1950s and the 1980s or the 1990s, there was some intervening risk that may have happened. Let me give you an example. The oil embargoes of, 19, of the early 1970s and the late 1970s. These oil embargoes produced a huge cost to the American people of energy production, of energy uh, consumption. So there was risk present in, from, uh, from the 70s onward that caused an energy crisis, resulting in a, in a rise of prices for energy. And this would have an impact on uh, economic production, because it costs more to produce something. You have a greater sacrifice to produce an equal reward. Energy costs more. Another possibility, information and knowledge. Production of information and knowledge after World War II was immense. The United States came out of World War II as a leader in, technolo in technology production, in engineering. It was all located here in the United States. And we enjoyed that boom. <clears throat> so possibly, and this is what I would like to posit as the reason why the production of economics, uh, of economic production in the 1950s and the 60s was so great was because it was an outgrowth of the knowledge, of the engineering knowledge of production uh, immediately following uh, World War II. But that's not all. You know, throughout history, throughout the American history, we've had great examples of inventors coming forth and, and with each invention comes a, sp a spurt of economic development because it makes your sacrifice more efficient. And when you're max when you and the more that you're efficient, the greater the reward is per capita. Examples are Edison. Henry Ford. Production of the car, what a, what a great achievement. Andrew Carnegie, steel. And now the internet, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Sam Walton for retail, a history of American individualism has produced efficiencies. And an efficiency can only be gained by the factors inherent in the production in an economic production. In the economic production transaction equation is your risk, time, knowledge, effort, and sometimes material. 
producing your reward. Another th factor that has come on the scene since, really since about 1973, but really got underway in the late 70s that kills production or kills the growth of production and the, the efficiency of the American system producing the rewards for society was inflation. As you recall, late in the 1970s, during the Carter administration, bonds went to very to the uh, inflation went to 13 or 14 percent. Uh, bonds were were in the high teens and the low in low uh, uh, borrowing uh, costs were in the high teens and low 20s even. Finally, when Reagan came in, he shut down the sluices to the to the money printing over at the Federal Reserve and economics and economic prosperity, prosperity returned. This again has risen again, this, this specter. And, when, and, and we must, we must uh, remind you, how does inflation kill economic efficiency? It does so by taking, by d diminishing the value of the dollar. So the value of the dollar today is worth, will be worth much less later on, a year, two years from now. So the savers of society, of society are punished. This is happening again now, today. The Federal Reserve has been printing money and gold was just a few years ago at $700 just maybe a couple years ago, it's now what, 15, 1600? You've just halved your money. The value of your money to obtain a reward that's in your savings account just was halved in the last few years. And but before that too, in the late Bush era, gold was about 350 for many years. And then, in, uh, then it went to 700, and then the present regime took it from 700 well into whatever it is today, this is close to around 1600. This is also a tremendous uh, depreciator of your money and also of economic efficiency. So, so with the, ri uh, the risk of inflation, with the risk of, of uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, and uh, with the, the increase of knowledge uh, for after World War II and the present risk of inflation, we now have uh, that is probably the reason why our authors came to conclude that the growth was greater then than it is now. But the reasons are not that from taxation. The reasons are going to what makes up an economic sacrifice. And so I want to thank you for joining us and being here or watching The Philosophical Angle. And we'll see you next week.